Good morning, South Garland Baptist Church. Good morning. We're so glad that you are here this morning. It is a beautiful, beautiful day outside. It was a beautiful day yesterday. I did something I haven't done in a long time yesterday afternoon. I did yard work. And my back is complaining about it today, but it looked like the Dallas Arboretum in my backyard. I had a lot of interesting things like flowering and blooming, and so I got my lawnmower and just whacked them all down. But we are happy that you are here this morning. Let's stand together and open our service in song. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streets of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will sing. Blessed be the name. Morning, everybody, and welcome to South Garland Baptist Church this morning. We are so happy that you are here to worship with us. And um, I have on my Frog Camp T-shirt this week because we had Frog Camp uh, this week for our kids that are going into kindergarten through second graders. And we had four little froggies with us this week, and we had a blast. So if you see any of our froggies running around in their frog shirt. Be sure to ask them what they learned this week. You can read in the ministry highlight what their different lessons were about. Um, And so I encourage you to ask them. It was a good week of learning about God, learning about fully relying on God, but then also just learning about being together as a team, in a group, going out and adventuring. It was a great week. We had um, two of our kids go to our church, two of our kids do not. And so we are praying about the relationships that were built there. 
um, and some friendships that were made and praying that we can reach those other families um, and get to know them better and join them into our congregation. So um, it was a very good week of some good ministry. But there are a lot of exciting things coming up this week, or not just this week, but in the coming months. You'll notice in your bulletin um, that we are getting ready to start our sanctuary renovation in May. So there will be more details specifically on that and when that will happen, but we finally have a closer timeline to when that will be starting. And then we have Easter coming up really soon. And this year we are doing Easter Fest um, on Palm Sunday that afternoon. I think similar to kind of fall or fall festival, but Easter related. Um, and so this year what we're going to have is we're going to have six rotations that the kids will go through um, telling the Easter story as they build their own resurrection kits. Um, and in each of those booths will be an activity for them to do. And then at the end, they'll get candy. There'll be bounce houses, that sort of thing to play with. Um, and so we are currently recruiting our leaders for each of the tents. And then for you as a church, we have areas where you can serve. We're going to need help with those tents. We're going to need help with registration. Um, we need you to start bringing in candy. Uh, next week, you'll see our baskets out. So please bring in candy just like you do for Halloween. Um, bring those things out. Um, and then we also need to borrow some pop-up tents. So if you have um, one of those kind of like tailgating pop-up tents, we have a few, but we're going to need a few more. So if you have one, um, please let us know. We would love to borrow those. Um, you just need to bring them the day of, and you can take it home that same day. Um, but we just need a few more to borrow. Other Easter activities to put on your calendar is going to be Monday, Thursday at 7 p.m., Good Friday service at 7 p.m., and then we will have a sunrise Easter service at 6.30 a.m. So be a fun um, week, holy week, um, centering our hearts on Jesus and what it is that he did for us. Um, but again, welcome to worship. If you are a guest with us, there's a green spot in your bulletin. If you would fill that out, drop it um, in a basket on your way out. We would love to get to know you better. And at this time, I'm going to ask that our kiddos come and join me right up here on the front steps for our children's message for today. So all of my friends, come join me up front. Take a seat right here on the floor. There we go, right down here. Perfect. All right. This way, right here. Okay, we have been learning about the life of Jesus, right? And we talked about a few weeks ago about Jesus as a little kid in the temple. And then last week, Mr. Jorge talked about Jesus being baptized and so now we're going to talk about Jesus and his ministry. He did a lot of things in his ministry. And one of the things that he did a lot of was teach. He did a lot of teaching. People knew there was something special about him. And so he did a lot of teaching, but he also healed people. And one time we see this story in Mark chapter 2 where there was a friend who was paralyzed. Who knows what paralyzed means? Paralyzed mean, Lacey? He couldn't walk, but not only could he couldn't walk, he couldn't do what else? Landon? He couldn't move at all, right? He couldn't move at all. So he was fully paralyzed. He couldn't move, but he had some friends who cared about him a lot. How many of you have friends that you care about? Yeah, you have friends that you cared about. Yeah, we had some friends this week who wanted to make sure they took turns and cared for each other. Well, these friends of this paralyzed guy said, you know, I think we can help him. We need to get him to Jesus but their friend couldn't walk. If you had a friend who couldn't walk and you needed to take him somewhere, what would you do? If you had a friend and they couldn't walk, what would you do, Henry? <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad you don't have a friend. That's good. Well, you have friends. You just don't have a friend that can't walk. Um, but pretend in your mind that you had a friend who can't walk. What would you do if you wanted to take them somewhere? Landon? A wheelchair, okay, a wheelchair could work. Yeah, you could help them sit down and stuff, maybe get them in a car, right? But if we look back at Jesus' time, did they have wheelchairs back then? No, they didn't have wheelchairs. Did they have cars? No, they didn't have cars back then. Did they have doctors? They had some doctors. But did they have a lot of medicine like we do today? No, they didn't. 
they didn't. And so these friends, they said, you know what? We're going to take them to Jesus because we've heard that Jesus can heal all things. But Jesus was far away. So you know what they did? They put him on a mat and they carried him. Would that be tiring? You think your arms would get tired from carrying a mat? But they did. They carried him because they said, if we get him to Jesus, Jesus can heal him. So they carried him all this way, get him to the house where Jesus is teaching at, and they get there, and instead of the door being open, kind of like ours is, where they could just walk in, it was crowded. There were no seats. People were sitting on the floor or standing. They were outside the door. They were outside the windows. There were so many people trying to hear Jesus, they couldn't get in the door. So do you think, what do you think they did? What do you think they did, Landon? The roof. They had to get creative, didn't they? Now, they could have just turned and walked away, right? How many of us have just given up when something gets hard? Yeah, I have too. We just give up. Something is hard or the normal way of doing things, it didn't work, did it? So they had to get creative. They had to get their friend to Jesus, but the normal way wouldn't work, so they went through the roof. Wouldn't it be really silly right now if things just kind of started falling from the sky and then all of a sudden a person came dropping in? Wouldn't that be kind of weird? But that's what happened. Jesus was teaching just like we're doing right now. We're sitting and we're talking and we're learning. And then all of a sudden things started falling from the ceiling. And then a person came lowering down. Isn't that kind of crazy? What do you think the reaction of the people in the room was? What would your reaction be if that started happening right now? Maybe scared. But you know what their reaction was? They were, they were mad that this person interrupted this time with Jesus and that Jesus forgave this person. He healed him. He healed him. He forgave him, and he said, get up and go. And they were upset. That doesn't make sense, does it? No. But Jesus said it's the faith of his friends that healed him. And that anyone, and that Jesus can heal anyone's sins. And that is pretty cool, right? Whether we come through the door dressed in our Sunday best, or whether we come through the ceiling not even knowing what we're doing there, Jesus will still love us and forgive us of our sins. Isn't that cool? All right, let's pray, and then we're going to continue on our worship, okay? Dear Jesus, thank you so much that you love us no matter which way we get to you, Lord whether it's because we were raised in the church or because we're here for the first time, Lord. It doesn't matter which way we get to you. What matters is that you love us so much that you will forgive us no matter what our sins are. And we thank you for that, Lord. Help us to center our hearts on you this morning, Lord, and what it is that you have for us. We ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, you can go be seated. Thank you so much, Ashley, for your lesson this morning. I It's on my heart to say this to you guys because uh, Ashley's message to the kids is really profound because we have a church member who has been paralyzed and, among other things, could not feel his hands because of an accident that he had. Uh, And I'm talking about our friend David Johanning behind me here who's not been here for five or six weeks because of an accident, was paralyzed, couldn't feel his hands, couldn't play his guitar, Uh, And because of the prayers of the church, many of you have been praying for him and his family. And I know that uh, Joyce has been on Facebook and on all of the the email uh, avenues throughout the church to pray for David. And uh, because of the prayers in the name of the Lord, David is recovering and is well and is back with us for the first time this week uh, with his guitar in hand. So that's an answer to prayer. And that message, that, that story that Ashley told just played out before us in actual real life within our church. So amen to that. Let's stand together as we continue to sing about the name of the Lord.
Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. We give you thanks and praise your glorious name. May his glorious name be praised forever. The whole earth is filled with his glory. We give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Your name is a song and a mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. We give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Your name is power. Your name is mighty. Your name is holy. Your name brings light. There is strength in the name of the Lord. There is power in the name of the Lord. There is hope in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed Savior, we adore Thee.
Thank you for singing. You may be seated. From John's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 26. And when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Let's pray. Mighty God, Lord of the universe, we, uh, we take this time to show some gratitude. Father, uh, in, in a time right now where so much of the world's conversation is uh, dominated by talks of war, and grumbling and complaints of gas prices, Father, we take this time to show gratitude, to show thankfulness. Father, thank you that I have the means to be able to put gas in my car. Thank you for the means to have a transportation. Thank you for the roof over my head and the food in my stomach, for a place where I can meet with other Christians, for the body of Christ to be able to meet together and to be able to, to sing and worship you, for your word to be read without fear of persecution. Father, we are truly blessed. And Father, at this time, I pray that we remember that blessing as we give back to you such a small portion of what you've entrusted to us. Father, I pray that you would bless this offering and continue to bless uh, the people here that love you so much. In Jesus' name.
Good morning, church family. We have been blessed this morning by the music that we have enjoyed together. We've been blessed by those who have led us in the playing and the singing of that music. And so I'm grateful to those who have led us this morning and especially grateful to have David back with us just as Jeffrey mentioned earlier, that was a scary fall several weeks ago, and David, it's the best part of my day so far has been getting to give you a big bear hug whenever I saw you this morning, so we're, we're glad to have you back. We're thankful to you for leading us in worship this morning. If y'all have got your Bibles, we're in John chapter 19 this morning, verses 26 and 27. Shane read our verses just a minute ago, John 19, 26 and 27, over the course of this season of Lent, what we're doing is during the children's message, we're getting an idea of what happened during the life of Jesus. And during the message for the assembled church body, what we're getting is we're going straight to the cross. And each week, we've been looking at one of the seven things that Jesus actually said from the cross. One of the last things that he said with his dying breaths. And so what's been interesting the first two weeks is how in doing this, in looking at the cross of Christ and listening to what it is that Jesus said from that cross, we've also been seeing some of the other characters who were part of that scene. In our first week, as we heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We were reminded of those who put Jesus there in the first place. We were reminded of the soldiers, the Roman soldiers who put him on that cross. Reminded of the Jewish religious officials who had conspired against him and handed him over to the Romans. We were reminded of the disciples who had taken off running into the night when Jesus had been seized in the garden. Just last Sunday, when Jesus turned to the thief dying on the cross next to him and said, today you will be with me in paradise, we were reminded that Jesus was not there alone on the cross, that he died with a criminal on his left and another on his right, that there were three crosses on the hill of Golgotha that day. And so today, As we look at John 19, 26, and 27, our scope expands even a little bit more as we bring two more characters into the picture, Mary and John. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John, the beloved disciple, the only one who made his way back to the cross after having fled in the garden. Both of these figures, both of these individuals are crucial characters in the life and ministry of Jesus, but they took very different paths to the cross. And yet what we see in these two verses is that ultimately it is the cross that brings them together. That's what the Lord does. Ours is a Lord who creates something out of nothing, who brings beauty out of tragedy, and who binds broken people together in him. So what we're going to do this morning is a little bit of a character study of Mary on the one hand and John on the other, And see then how it is that the cross binds them together. And so we begin with Mary. Because it really does all start with Mary. Mary, like the old song says, was the first one to carry the gospel. Mary was the first one to deliver the word of God. And the way in which she did so was much more trying and much more difficult and much more powerful than anything that a preacher does on a Sunday morning. 
Mary, you remember from Christmas time, was this woman who was visited by the angel Gabriel. Visited right there in her home and told that though she was a virgin, she was also now a mother. That through her, God was bringing about his new creation. That through her, the Messiah was to come. That she was to be the mother of Jesus. The mother of this anointed one promised by the prophets. And that Mary from Nazareth was the one being given this incredible privilege. And so as we remember from Christmas time, she goes with her faithful husband-to-be, her betrothed Joseph, to Bethlehem because of the imperial census. And it is there that baby Jesus' first bed comes not in a palace but a stable. His first bed is not down, but rather a manger, a feeding trough for animals. It's in Jesus' earliest days that Mary and Joseph take the baby into the temple and are met there by two older figures from the community. The prophet Simeon, the prophetess Anna, and each of them bless this child, bless these parents and one proclaims something that we see fulfilled here in our passage this morning says to mary that a sword will pierce your soul as a result of this of this gift that god has given to you that along with the tremendous blessing of being the mother of the christ mary will suffer tragedy as well mary of course doesn't just give birth to Jesus, she raises him. And we see that when Jesus is 12 years old, he goes to the temple, and having begun to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men, when Mary and Joseph cannot find their son, looking all around, they ultimately find him there in the temple teaching the teachers, delivering the word to those who know it best. Mary's even there at the first miracle that Jesus performs. She and her son are there in Cana at a wedding when it's discovered that there's not enough wine for all of the guests. And Mary is the one who urges Jesus on. Jesus, though the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus, though the Alpha and Omega, Jesus, though he is the one who knows all things and is the very epitome of wisdom, Jesus listens when his mama tells him to do something. And so when she says, there's not enough wine for the party, and he says, it's not yet my time, she turns to the ones throwing the party and says, do whatever he tells you. And Jesus transforms the water into wine, and his ministry begins with this miracle. Mary, in these early days of Jesus is the epitome of humility and faithfulness and obedience to God. She is one who is given a task by God and takes it on as her own. She is faithful to what God has called her to do. And she is special Indeed, exalted among all women because she is Jesus' family, his own flesh and blood. But then we get this this one more appearance from Mary before we get to the cross in John 19. And this one is a little troubling. This is one that bothers us when we read it. So I'm going to read it for you. It's from Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through 35. You'll find parallel passages in Matthew 12 and Luke 8, but I'm going to read it from Mark's gospel, starting in chapter 3, the 31st verse. It says that then his mother and his brothers, the mother and brothers of Jesus, they came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. 
And a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside looking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. That passage always bothers us just a little bit whenever we read it. Because Jesus, while it is, I want to be crystal clear on this, there is no sin that happens in this story. Jesus does nothing against the will of God. He does not sin here. Nevertheless, an honest reading of the passage, he's kind of rude to his mom here. They're calling for him. His mom is sending for him. And instead of going where his mother is, he looks around at a crowd of strangers and says, who's my mom? Who's my brothers? Y'all, you, those who do the will of God, you are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. It, it's uncomfortable for us to read because it feels dismissive of his own flesh and blood. What Jesus is doing here is he's elevating his spiritual family, those who do the will of God, even at the expense of the family of his flesh and his blood. And it's that spiritual family, those who do the will of God, that brings us to our second character who finds his way to the cross. John. John, the son of Zebedee and the brother of James. He enters the scene in Mark chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, right after Simon, who would go on to be called Peter, and his brother Andrew are called by Jesus to become his disciples. Almost immediately after that, Jesus is walking along the shore with his two new buddies when he comes across James and across John. And they are fishermen as well. They're there mending their nets. And Jesus gives the same instruction to them that he'd given to Simon and to Andrew. Follow me. And scripture tells us that immediately they leave their nets, they leave their father's business, and they follow. It's a good start. For John. But we see as we read through the Gospels that he is far from perfect. Matter of fact, the nickname that Jesus gave to him and his brother is the Sons of Thunder. And you can see why when you read some of the stories that feature these two. They both show up in Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 55. Jesus is making his way through the region and wants to pass through a town that is held by the Samaritans enemies of the Jewish people. There's a blood feud between these two groups. And the Samaritan village says, we don't want you coming through. One, you're Jews. Two, you're a lot of trouble. So we'd rather you go around. Well, James and John, never one to back down from a fight or from a perceived insult, say, Jesus, here's what happened. They don't want us going through, so we have a little suggestion. What if you go all Elijah on them and just call down fire on the whole village. That seems like an equitable reaction. That's a proportional response, wouldn't you say? Jesus rebukes the two and they make their way on. But this gives us a little idea of who it is we're dealing with here. Mark 10, 35 through 45, they come to Jesus with a different suggestion this time. They say, Lord, it seems like we're getting to the end of this ministry of yours, and it's getting close to the time when you are going to come into your glory. Close to the time when you are going to prove yourself to be the king of Israel, and you'll wipe out these Romans who are oppressing us, and you will come into your kingdom. And when that happens, when you win victory over our enemies, when the crown is yours, I know you've got these other ten guys that are trailing along. I just want to call dibs right now. How about you put one of us at your right hand, one of us at your left hand? 
One of us gets to be vice president. The other one gets to be secretary of state. Jesus isn't having anything of this particular proposal. John's an impetuous kind of guy. Not afraid to say what he's thinking, afraid to say what he wants. We give Simon Peter a really hard time for being the reckless one. He wasn't the only one in this group of 12 who had his own ideas. And yet, and yet there's something about him, something about him that Jesus loves. Something about him that makes him special. He, along with his brother and along with Simon Peter, are part of the so-called inner circle of Jesus. Because they get to bear witness to some things that the other nine disciples don't get to see. When Jesus goes into the home of Jairus, whose daughter has recently died, Jesus brings with him only three of the disciples. James and Peter and John. And only they are there when he raises this little girl from the dead. When Jesus goes up, up the mountain and is transfigured, and sits there with Moses and with Elijah, this dazzling, glorious display. Only three of the disciples go up there with him. James and Peter and John. And when the hour of Jesus' greatest trial comes, when he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray to his Father, to prepare for all that is to come, to prepare for for the beatings, to prepare for the nails, to prepare for his very death. Three of his disciples come with him into the garden. James and Peter and John. In the gospel that bears his name, John is known as the beloved disciple or the one Jesus loved. He is marked as special in some way. He's flawed, make no mistake. He's impetuous and impulsive to be sure but he is jesus's spiritual brother we get these two singular characters here mary and john the mother of jesus and the disciple of jesus one who is his family by birth one who is his family by the Spirit. One who is humble and obedient. One who is rash and reckless. These two people who are different genders, different generations, come from different towns. And there at the cross, Jesus does something remarkable. He brings them together. He ensures that his mother will be taken care of when her son is gone. He ensures that his disciple will have a purpose when he leaves. He ensures that the family his father chose for him and the family he chose for himself will be connected forever. So the question is, what does all of this that happened 2,000 years ago, what does all of this mean for us? Because a surface reading of these two verses, John 19, 26, and 27, a surface reading says Jesus is really just doing a little bit of housekeeping from the cross. That with his dying breath, he's just making sure that his mom is taken care of. And that's really all there is to it. But for you and me today, there's something deeper there if we'll listen to it. Jesus says to Mary, woman, 
This is your son. It says to John, this is your mother. And it reminds us of what it is Jesus is creating. Not just a social club, not just a nonprofit organization. Jesus is making a family. People who will break bread together. People who will rejoice together in times of celebration and who will weep together in times of tragedy. People who will take care of one another in any and all circumstances. The church of Jesus Christ does these things not because we're flesh and blood, not because we agree on everything, not because we're all the same. We do it because our love for Jesus is bigger than everything else. We do it because we recognize, we believe, and we proclaim that Jesus is not only Lord of heaven and earth, he's Lord of us, Lord of our lives, Lord of his church. Jesus is the one who binds us and brings us together. A couple days ago, I was doing my own yard work of a certain kind. Jeffrey mentioned he did his yesterday. I'd gotten one of those lovely notices from the city of Garland letting me know that I was not compliant with city code. Our backyard fence had a few boards that had rotted out and fallen off and needed to be replaced because when you drove down the alley you could see into my backyard and the due date for that particular task was coming quick and so I got out in the backyard and took hammer and nail and new boards pulled out the old boards and replaced them simple job didn't take more than 45 minutes to replace these boards and nail by nail, the new board went on over the old board and bound them together. Some 2,000 years ago, hammer met nail. And the result is that Jesus made a new family, a spiritual family, bound together by what he did on that old rugged cross. Because of the blood of Jesus, we are brothers and sisters. We are the spiritual descendants of Mary and of John. We're family, bound together not by flesh and blood, not by similarity or circumstance. We are bound together by our Lord and what he did on that cross. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the new family that you created by your life, by your death, and by your resurrection. 
And so, Lord, I pray that as we sit in this room with our friends, with our neighbors, with our children and our parents, with our husbands and wives, that we would remember that by the blood of Jesus, we are also sitting with our brothers and our sisters. That we are sitting together as the family of God. And so, Lord, I pray that when we think about the cross, we would think not only of what it means for us individually, but what it means for us together. That we would be mindful of, conscious of, how Jesus has given us a new family. How Jesus has bound us together by his blood. So Lord, may we here at South Garland Baptist Church, may we be a people who remember who and what is at the center of everything we do. May our proclamation be that Jesus is Lord. And may everything we do be about that simple truth. May Jesus be the heart, the soul of everything we do and everything we are. It's in Christ's name that I pray all of these things. Amen. In just a moment, the praise team will lead us in a hymn. We'll sing together about the matchless name of Jesus. I invite you this morning if the Holy Spirit is working in your heart today, if this morning you need to have a conversation about the lordship of Jesus, what it means for Jesus to be lord of your life, right after the service is over, I'll be right at the back, shaking hands, giving hugs, ready to talk with you. If this morning you're someone who's been visiting us for a little while now and you're ready to join this church. You're ready to claim this group as your brothers and sisters in faith. Come and find me right in the back. I'll be right dead center. Let's talk about you becoming a member of this church. I invite you, however you respond, to respond to what you've heard, respond to what we've done together as brothers and sisters. And the beginning of that response comes through song the singing of the hymn. So let's respond to worship. Let's stand and let's sing. Take the name of Jesus we
Thank you for your presence here this morning. Thank you for your worship. The only announcement that I want to remind you of, Ashley mentioned it at the beginning, but I'll just reiterate this, and you'll hear us saying this a lot over the next month and a half, is that we are preparing for our sanctuary renovation to begin at the beginning of May. And so in between, there is a lot that will need to be done. We will give you updates on when work days happen and those sorts of things, because this room's going to have to be empty come that first day that we are down in Davis Hall for, for worship and the renovation in here begins. So you will get more information about that. In the meantime, here are the things that you can be doing to get ready for that. Number one, you can be in prayer because there will be a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot of I's that need to be dotted, T's that need to be crossed. So you can be in prayer. Number two, if you are someone who committed to uh, give to our capital campaign to raise funds for this sanctuary renovation, you made a commitment to give through pledges over the course of that time. Stay up to date on your pledges. Letters will be going out reminding you of that, but stay up to date on the commitment that you made back in November. And number three, if you did not make a commitment, but you would like to, here's how it works. We will always take the checks. Um, we can still continue adding to that total. These are the ways you can be helping for now as the time comes to prepare to move things out of here and get ready. We will let you know as that comes, but be looking forward at the beginning of May to that renovation. As we head out now, let me leave you with this word of benediction, that our profession of faith is that Jesus is Lord. May that profession be not only what guides us individually, but what binds us together as a church. Go in his name.